My name is Piper Niehaus, and I am an adventurer. I like to go backpacking, go skiing, explore the mountains around Colorado, where I'm from, the United States. I'm also a software engineer at Pivotal, and I've been using Elm in production since 2016 on the Pivotal tracker team, as well as using Kotlin on the internal products and services team at Pivotal. So I've been, I've been doing the pure functional thing for a minute here. And what I want to talk to all of you about today is our excitement around new languages. Everybody knows that excitement, that feeling where you're like, I found this great thing, and I just want to use it. I want to take it as far as I can take it. I think it's awesome. Once you start using languages in production, things change. You end up with all these reality checks. Suddenly, you can't have bugs. You got to be able to test stuff. You have to be able to maintain stuff and explain it to future developers. So what I want to talk to you about today is what happens when you start using a language that is rare but awesome in production. We're going to start by just going over what is the promise of Elm. You know, our goal today is for you all to have some understanding of what Elm is. We also want to talk about the production hump. What happens when you start using a language like Elm in production? And then what's next? Where can you take this information? So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about Elm. I'm going to tell you about our specific experiences. And then we're going to talk about, is Elm right for you? What's the next things that you can do here? So a little bit of background on Elm. Elm is a DSL for web apps. It is a language, a framework, and an ecosystem. We're mostly going to talk about the language and the framework here, because that's, I think, the part that's most interesting for us. A lot of companies have started using Elm in production. I wouldn't say it's super widely adopted, but it's definitely out there. People have heard about it. People are thinking about it. Elm started as Evan Chaplicki's Harvard thesis. He's now at No Red Ink, and he's basically Elm's benevolent dictator for life. Uh, that means he's controlling the design, the direction, the priorities, the pace of the product. So he is really the place where the buck stop, stops with Elm. So that's a little bit about how Elm started. Now let's talk a little bit about the language. So before we get started, who here enjoys coding? Anybody coding? All right, good, I'm in the right room. Uh, who here has heard of functional programming? Hoping most people, yeah. What about Redux? Has anybody heard of Redux, used Redux? Great, lots of people. So how many people had heard of Elm before this talk? A few people, okay, cool. How many people have tried Elm? Okay, got a couple. How many people have used Elm in production? Cool, just me. So it, <laughs> it seems like there's a little bit of space here for me to tell you about this language. Let's get started. Uh, Elm compiles to JavaScript, and the main things about it are that it is pure functional, and it has a strong static type system with a friendly compiler. So that's, I'm just going to run you through that stuff. Uh, what is a pure function? And again, we're going really basic here because I think that a lot of times people throw these terms around. They don't really know what they mean. They just sound awesome and you think, okay, I'm going to say this, but you don't really know. So a pure function is just a function that takes input and returns output and doesn't affect anything outside of itself and isn't affected by anything outside of itself. So you can see on the left there, we have a pure function. It takes some arguments, it does some computations, and it returns a value. On the right, we have an impure function. It takes some arguments, it does some computations, maybe it sets some variables outside of itself, maybe it's affected by some variables outside of itself, and then it has a return value. In practice, you can see, again, you're having variables outside of yourself, that makes you impure. So what is a pure versus an impure functional programming language? We've talked about pure functions. What's the difference between a functional programming language and an impure functional programming language? Well, a pure functional language just lets you do pure functional programming. There's no outside, there's no ability to be sloppy. So Elm and Haskell are common examples of a pure functional language. An impure functional language is, some, is a language that lets you do either. You can 
shoot yourself in the foot. You can decide, oh, I'm going to set this external variable. So that's Kotlin, Python, most people, most languages you use. You can code functionally in them, but you don't have to. There's nothing enforcing it for you. So what are some of the benefits of pure functional programming? It's super consistent. Every time you call a function with a certain set of arguments, you will always get the same response. There's no external variables happening. The code is really easy to follow. When you have a pure functional language, because there's nothing outside of functions affecting what you're doing, it's really easy to say, I had this input, I got this output, all set. You're not going to have race conditions. You're not going to have weird places uh, where crazy things is happening in the code. In Elm, one of the coolest things you get because of pure functional programming is the time travel debugger. Basically, you can look at your system in any state and go backwards and forwards. So you could say, oh, I'm having this bug. Let me drop back a sec and see where, how, how I got there. So here's a little example of that. You can see every time I push that button, I'm getting another bang. And on the right in the time table debugger, I'm getting an increment message. And then I can click on any of those increment messages and see my system at any state. So I can see it with one bang, two bangs. Uh, you can imagine this would be a lot more helpful if you had a more complicated app, but it's still pretty cool in this state. So that's a little bit about the language's pure functional state. Let's talk a bit about strong static typing. So when people hear about types, it's another one of those words that they just like to throw around and they don't necessarily know what it means. Uh, so we're just going to talk about some basics. An object's type is the description of the kind of data in that object and what it can do. So really basic, a string or an integer. Something that people often forget is that all languages must check types. There's no languages that get away without doing that. The question is when they check types. So static typing is when types are checked at compile time. Whereas dynamic typing is when types are checked at runtime. So as a user, when I'm using an application that's created in a statically typed language, I shouldn't see exceptions at runtime, hopefully. I should, my developers should see them. So we're going to talk about three kinds of typing here. Dynamic typing, like I said, types checked at runtime. Static typing, che types checked at compile time. And what I'm calling strong static typing, which is static typing, but with the goal of minimizing the gap between code that compiles and code that runs error free. So just some background here. Static typing is a thing. People do static typing. That's you know, a, a computer science term. Strong static typing is a colloquialism. People throw it around all the time, but it doesn't mean the same thing to everyone. So this is the definition that we're going to be using today. When people hear static typing, they tend to think, oh, I'm going to just hit a compiler a bunch, and it's going to be painful. And even when I'm done hitting the compiler, I'm still going to have errors. And that's just not the case with strong static typing. So you can see over there on the left, that's Ruby, or a language like it, where the code compiles and the code runs without errors are two really different things. There are many times when your Ruby code could be running and might have errors. With normal static typing, uh, the code's going to compile and the code's going to run without errors are going to be closer together. There's going to be less time when your code is able to compile and it has errors. And then finally, strong static typing, like Elm or Haskell, most of the time, if your code compiles, it will run. So there's a bunch of tools that Elm uses to take static typing and make it stronger. Elm allows you to define custom types. Elm has strong null checking. So you can say, this is a string, and you know that it will never be null. It also has exhaustiveness checking. So if I say that a pet is a cat, a dog, or a fish, and Fido is a pet, then anywhere that I use Fido, I must account for the possibility that Fido could be a cat, a dog, or a fish. I can't just say, well, I've met Fido, and I know that Fido is a dog. 
So some of the benefits of strong static typing are that it catches errors early. You don't get null pointer exceptions. You don't get, oh, this was a string, but I passed it an int. It provides parameter and return type matching, which makes your code really easy to read. It makes impossible states impossible, which means you don't actually have to test them. And it allows you to encode your business logic into the type system. As a developer, it means that I'm able to focus on my business logic rather than having to think about edge cases. It gives me fast feedback about how my app is doing. And it makes my code really easy to read and to refactor. One of the coolest things about Elm is that not only is it strongly statically typed, but it also has a really friendly compiler. So if you've used other statically typed languages, you probably think of the compiler as more of a jerk than a friend. Well, Elm's friendly compiler makes it really easy to rely on the compiler the way that you would rely on your own tests. So for example, here, I have a little function called add ints, but I actually accidentally called it add ints with some extra s's. When I look at that compiler error, it actually suggests for me what might be the name of the function that I'm looking for. So it's way nicer than getting an ugly, ugly compiler error. So that's a little bit about the back, about background and, and information about the Elm language. Let's talk about the Elm architecture. So the Elm architecture is a way of building web applications. And what it does is it separates your application into the model, update, and view. So the model is the application's current state. The update is the only way to update that state. And the view is what you see on the page, your HTML. And we, can I get those hands up again? Who would use Redux? All right, so Redux is actually based upon Elm. That's where it has its genesis. So it's an architecture that you can use in any language that you want, uh, but it feels particularly natural in Elm. It works particularly well because that's where it started. So again, most people have used Redux, so this shouldn't be, sh you shouldn't need too much explanation. But basically, let's say a user makes a change. There's gonna be a listener that happened in the, in the view, like an on-click handler, and that listener is gonna send a message to the update function. The update, again, only way you can update your app. The um, update function is gonna take your old model, make a new model based on your function arguments, and put out that new model as its output. That new model is gonna be passed into the view function and then rendered in the browser. So it's very simple. If some part of your view changed, that's all handled within the update to the model. So for example, here's that really simple app that we saw earlier, and here's what that's gonna look like in code. I don't wanna spend too much time talking about it, uh, but you can see there's a model, a view, an update. It's very simple. So what are some benefits of the Elm architecture? It provides a single source of truth. You never have to wonder if something weird might be changing your code. You don't have one part of a view affecting another part of a view. It all just goes straight into the update loop and into the model. It makes it really easy to understand and avoid race conditions. And it ensures that your model and your view always stay in sync. So going back over all the stuff we've talked about so far, why would you use Elm? The answer is because of the language and the architecture. The combination of static typing and pure functions with the Elm architecture, which again, similar to Redux, means you run into very few runtime errors, which is something that as a developer, I really appreciate. So we've talked a bit about the promise of Elm. So now let's talk about what happens when you take this cool, hot language and you start using it in production. I'm gonna talk to you about some background. How did we get here? Why did we decide to put this rare new language in our code base, other than that it's awesome and I talked to you about all the benefits? Uh, what does it mean to use types and functional programming in practice? How does Elm scale? You don't see a lot of big scale apps when you have little examples on the internet. 
And then how do you do testing? Again, you don't really test a little random trial that you're doing on the internet. And finally, how does it work with JavaScript? You're going to need to use a lot more libraries in production than you would with your random test app. Does that actually work? So starting out with us using Elm on Pivotal Tracker, back in 2016, we were a Ruby on Rails React backbone app. We actually still have all of those languages in our code base. It's very fun. In 2016, we started having a lot of conversations around Elm. We had one developer on our team who was really into it, and he worked with other people and started saying, hey, I like this. I'd like to use it. We ended up writing our dashboard page, which is the first landing page on Pivotal Tracker in Elm. And then we started writing our new user experience in Elm and our project memberships page in Elm. Lately, over the last few months, we haven't had a new big feature like that to implement, but we have been experimenting with Kotlin, which is another uh, language that has a type system as well as some functional aspects, uh, and with TypeScript and trying to see if maybe our JavaScript could be made a little bit more functional, could use types better. So here's some places that we have Elm in production on Pivotal Tracker. If you've used Tracker, these pages will look familiar. The decision to use Elm. So when we were deciding to use Elm, it was based upon people having used Elm in their personal projects and really strongly recommending it. And many, many meetings definitely took convincing to get our engineering director on board. <laughs> we really wondered, was Elm going to stick around? Was there going to be good interop with other languages? Was it going to be weird and annoying for developers to have to use other languages as well as Elm and just having a lot going on? So we started in a really isolated piece of our app with that dashboard page. We made sure it was something that wouldn't need to inter interconnect too much with other stuff and that would be relatively easy to pull out if we absolutely hated Elm. So again, that's that dashboard page. We, disc we ended up having a bit of a learning curve on our first project. We found that it just took a couple of weeks to get your head around Elm and see what it was all about. For me, it felt kind of uncomfortable in those first couple of weeks. But by the end of you know, six weeks or so, most developers really liked Elm, and I am definitely one of them. I find it to just be one of the most fun and comfortable languages to code in. We did run into some challenges. For example, scaling an Elm app. Like I said, it's not something that you do when you're just playing around with a new language. And then the other big challenge we run into is testing philosophies, especially at the time we were working on this dashboard page. People weren't testing Elm that much. The libraries were pretty new, and we have a strong culture of, tra of testing at Pivotal. As we expanded our usage, our testing strategies really started to hit a stride. Elm has also caught up as far as testing. And we have started to run into the challenge of trying to interrupt with JavaScript exter external libraries. Again, I'll talk about it some more. As we go forward, we're still using Elm mentalities, but we are also using other languages. So, you know, some more Elm, some TypeScript, some Kotlin. So that's our background. I'm going to talk now about some specifics about that stuff. So types and functional programming and practice. Elm really lives up to its promise. We really have enjoyed using it. We've had runtime errors are a thing of the past. Race conditions don't really happen. Refactoring is super easy. And one of the biggest things that happened for us is that our mindset really changed. One of the biggest mindset changes was encoding business logic into our types. So I talked about managing our project members via Elm. Project members are people in Tracker can fall into people who are already a member of a project or people who are being invited to a project. And for us, it was really easy to just encode that into the type system. So you can see if I wanted to show this page uh, on my website, so Luke and Leia are members, Han Solo is not, classic, always late to the party. Nobody seen Star Wars? Come on. <laughs> and here what you can see, and again, it's a little bit small, but you can see I can create a project member type and an invitee type and just encode that into my types so that in my view, there is no risk that I'm going to accidentally try and get a name for someone whose name I don't have in the system. 
So beyond using types and functional programming in practice, scaling was the next big hurdle that we reached. How do you structure a large LMAP? It's actually a really odd question because if you're used to object-oriented programming, in object-oriented programming, it's really obvious how you structure things. Well, this is a class. It has certain methods. It is a file into itself. In functional programming, we don't have the same kinds of conventions around how to structure things. And that's been one of the biggest hurdles we've hit, as well as one of the biggest FAQs. We have a blog post about Elm, and people keep posting on it saying, hey, give us an example app. I want to know how to structure things. So we weren't sure if we should be having big files, small files. Should we have one big update loop for our entire app, multiple update loops, et cetera? So scaling ended up being a puzzle that had a mindset to it. So let's just talk a little bit about how scaling of apps works in Elm. It's a bit of a puzzle with, uh, I kind of talked about this stuff, but less obvious structure to a pure functional app. But basically, Elm apps are broken into modules. Each file is a module, and modules have public functions as well as private functions. This is something most people are familiar with. When you get started with Elm, you're going to have something more similar to what's on the left over there, which is to say, one file. When you have almost no code, there's no reason to break it down into multiple files. As you get bigger, you might start to feel like you want a couple files. Maybe all your HTML belongs by itself. As you get even bigger, you might start breaking it into kind of your update loop, a view, and then more stuff. And that's kind of where things start to get complicated. So the way we ended up solving this was with a mindset change. We had a bunch of debates. At first, we really wanted to create a Ruby on Rails for Elm. We wanted to say, our Elm app will always be structured this way. What we ended up deciding was that we were able to refactor easily and have some guidelines for ourselves, and we didn't need that kind of structure. So what we ended up doing is we would just start creating our app, keep everything all together at the beginning, and then as things started to self-group, into things that were similar to each other, we would just refactor them out. And with the type system, we were able to just do the refactor and let the compiler tell us when we had issues. So what we ended up with was this idea that you know, we will start big, make it smaller, generally structure things as they made sense. And then we had one more piece that we added to this. And that was that we should be using testing to drive our file structure. And that's something that was really kind of new at the time when we were starting to do this because people weren't testing Elm that much. So I'm going to start talking to you a bit about testing, and that should explain a bit more how you can use tests to drive your file structure. So there's a myth in Elm that if it compiles, it works. It's largely true. Like I said, if it compiles, it likely runs error-free. However, you still need to test your business logic. So let's say you are trying to use a string where you needed an int. You can't do that. But let's say you're using the totally wrong int. I can't help you. That's not something that Elm will, will stop you from doing. Where we landed was what I like to call test slash type driven development. So everybody knows TDD. How many people here? TDD, cool, good crowd, good coding. So the idea here is that we are using both compiler failures and tests to drive our code. The compiler is going to ensure that our code runs, but the tests are there to ensure that our business logic is fulfilled. So here's a little example. I've got a little test that expects a function to exist. It does not exist. Therefore, the compiler is going to fail. Now I make the function exist. So here we have a little function. It takes a couple strings and puts them together. Cool. My function exists, but all it does is it returns a string that is empty. It doesn't really fulfill the promise of the business logic. So now I write, a I write code that makes my test pass. And voila, my test pass, I can refactor. So simple example, but you can see how the compiler can drive you to write code just like your tests do. So that's testing in the Elm language. 
Now, what about in an Elm application? Like I said, we don't have a set structure. It's not a Rails app where you have a controller and you test your controller. You know, it's a lot, it's a lot more freeform. So we're back in that first modules phase where we've just broken our app out into two files, our update loop basically in our view. And the first thing we decided was that we were gonna test our update loop, but not test our view. And the reason for that is that testing in, or excuse me, the reason for that is that although we wanted to test our business logic, because we think that's really, really important and the update loop is the main driver of our business logic, we felt like tests on the view would be super brittle. If you've ever had an integration test that tested that you had the exact right text on a page, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's really annoying to have your tests fail when you just change a word. And that's especially true in Elm because there isn't really a great library and especially in 2016 for testing your view. So where we ended up was we started making a selector is what we've called it. It's basically a view model and it sits in between that model and update function and the view. So as our data is traveling through our app, we have a model and then we use our selector to calculate a new state that is the actual state that we want to display. It's kind of a view state that has data that we don't need to store but that we really want to be able to test. And then we render our HTML based on that selector rather than based on our bare model. And that gives us a structure where we can write tests. Where that led us was to not just having our tests drive our structure in the sense that we had a selector, but also in the sense that we at Pivotal are very used to writing tests. And so we thought, okay, if we're trying to decide if we need to break out some code into a new module, Let's just ask ourselves, do we feel like we need to test this code? If the answer is yes, we're gonna need to expose this code because our tests are gonna need to reach it. If we're gonna need to expose it, we don't want it to just be used by our tests. We would like some other actual module to be calling our code. And so that made it really obvious. If there's something that we feel needs to be tested and it's not exposed, it should be in a new module so that's a little bit about testing. Now let's talk about JavaScript, JavaScript interop. That's been one of the big challenges and again, not something you would ever really face in an app that you weren't trying to use in production. So basically in Elm, we interop with JavaScript through ports and native code. And the thing about Elm is that you're pretty much signing up to have a multi-language code base. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So it becomes extra important to be able to interop with JavaScript well. The ship is because it has a bunch of portholes. You'll see that means. So we're gonna talk a little bit of background and then a little bit about maintaining that multi-language code base. So the background here, like I said, you can use ports and native code to communicate with JavaScript. Ports are the recommended way to do things. They hook into the up update loop. You get type safety. Native code is basically saying, I have a JavaScript library, let me put some Elm on top. We don't recommend native code, and in fact, it's not gonna keep working in future versions of Elm. So let's talk about ports. Basically, with a port, you have the update loop sending a command to JavaScript. The JavaScript subscribes to the port, gets the message, does the thing. You can also have a port that goes the other direction. JavaScript sends a message to Elm, Elm subscribes to the port, gets the message, and it goes through the update loop. Some good stuff here, you, anything Elm can do, JavaScript can do, or vice versa. Anything JavaScript can't, do, Elm can't do, JavaScript can do, let's put it that way. Gets you a lot more libraries. Elm is a new language, so you don't get a lot of libraries in it. The bummers about it are you're communicating via JSON. Every time you go out to a port, you're gonna have to deserialize and reserialize your JSON, and that can be a pain. You're also going in and out of type safety. So every time you're in JavaScript, you're no longer type safe. It also means you're gonna have multiple languages in your code base. Native code, again, super discouraged. 
This is the thing where you're wrapping your JavaScript library in Elm. It's not going to work on the next version of Elm, and it's just a little bit awkward. So what does it mean to use all of this? How do we maintain our multi-language code base here? Elm is growing, but it doesn't have a lot of libraries. So you're going to have to do ports if you're using Elm in production. Plus, the transition to Elm is super gradual. For us, we don't even have the goal of writing our whole app in Elm. That's not something that's on the table for us. Our app is too complex. We don't want to rewrite everything. So we're still going to have to use JavaScript, and we will forever. That creates a bunch of issues for us. It means that our developers are going to have to be proficient in many languages. It also means that we sometimes end up writing the same code in many languages, which is a bummer. It also means we're super dependent on libraries. So for example, React Elm Components is a library that helps you use Elm with React. It's actually out of date, so that's a bummer. And then the other thing here is that native libraries are on their way out. And that hasn't caused problems for us, but there are actually people out there who are using Elm in production who now are finding that they aren't going to be able to upgrade to the next version without making huge changes to their code. So that's a problem. So now what I want to talk to you about is what does this all mean? Is Elm the right fit for you? And the answer is it depends. But even if it's not the right fit for you, you might still be able to use some of the things that you've learned about Elm. So as a developer, I love using Elm. I find it feels really nice to code in. It's also fun to use a new language. I know that some companies who've used Elm have talked about how it makes hiring easier because people are excited about using it. People want to go places where they think they're going to learn. It's also let us be highly productive after we've ramped up, and it's made our refactors super easy, which we really appreciate. Some downsides, we have to know multiple languages. All the time that you're using coding in Elm is time that you're not getting better at JavaScript, which you have to use anyway. There's also some complexity with using ports. And again, if you've been using native code, you're going to be in trouble. It generally means you have a longer ramp up time for a new developer or even a developer rolling in from another part of your company. And with hiring, you know, it's hard to know. That might mean it might drive people away if they're looking for a place they can use the skills they already have. As a product owner or tester, I'd be pretty excited about the time travel debugger. Cool stuff there. If you find a bug as a tester, you can just export from the time travel debugger. And that'll just give you a state that your developer can then just upload into the debugger and use to replicate your error. So errors are instantly replicable, which is pretty awesome. There's also no runtime exceptions, which as a product owner is pretty nice. It means fewer bugs for you to put into your system. That said, there's a potential higher cost for features that require libraries. So an example for us was we wanted a fuzzy matcher. Basically, we wanted a little thing where I could import, I could type in text, and it would find text that kind of matched, but maybe not 100%. There's a library for that in JavaScript. That's something that's a solved problem, pretty much. We end up rolling our own, because it just made more sense for us with where we were at with Elm. So that significantly increased the cost of that feature. As a user who uses products that run on Elm, it's awesome. There's no runtime exceptions. I really appreciate that. The downside is probably there's less excitement in my life. I don't run into as many problems. And you know, I don't get to write angry, angry emails to the support staff at companies. And you know, I miss that. It lets me get my rage out. So now we've talked about whether Elm might or might not be right for you. What can you do with this information if Elm isn't right for you, if it's not the right thing? We still find that it's really important to encode your business logic into the type system. It makes your code easier to reason about, easier to understand, and gives you fewer errors. The same goes for making impossible states impossible. When you're encoding your logic into the type system, you're not going to get a state where you're asking for one thing and getting another. It's just impossible to happen in the code. And similarly, we think it's really important to remember that minimizing side effects minimizes confusion. There's a reason that Redux has gotten so popular. 
What we found is that culture can compensate for language. So TDD, how many people here, if you're doing a side project, you TDD every single thing? I'll, I'll TDD, yeah, I didn't think so, not that many people. There's culture around TDD. Getting your developers to TDD requires discipline. And so if you remember our diagram from earlier, where we have the space between code that just compiles and code that runs without errors, you can take code that just compiles and has some errors and make it code that when it compiles, it runs error free using culture. It's just gonna take a different amount of culture depending on what language you're looking at. So in Elm, it doesn't take a lot of culture to write good code because the compiler will yell at you. In Kotlin, it takes a little more culture. There's more stuff that can go wrong here. And I'm talking about Kotlin and TypeScript because that's what my team is experimenting with right now. And TypeScript, similar thing. I'd say even more culture required to really make it work for you if you want to be using strong static types and really thinking functionally. So let's talk about what some of those cultural shifts are between Kotlin and TypeScript. In Kotlin, you want to pay attention to warnings. There's some, some stuff in Kotlin that if this were Elm, you'd get a compiler error, but instead you get like a little like quiet warning thing that you might miss. You also want to be really functionally minded. So just make sure that you are writing code that if you're functional and then you'll get a lot of the benefits that you'd get with Elm. And you also want to avoid the bang bang. What the bang bang does is it says, I don't care about types. Shocking that I want you to avoid that if you want to be strongly statically typed. <laughs> so just an example here. Uh, this is a Kotlin file, and you can see there's an early return down here. This is not a functional way of doing things. In that early return, you're going to miss that this play with pet is missing a bird. So a pet is a dog, a cat, or a bird. We've only dealt with it being a dog or a cat. That'll give you a warning but it won't actually blow up at you. You can fix that by making sure that you have your setup correct in your build.gradle. So what about in TypeScript? Again, we're being functionally minded. We are looking at TypeScript and saying, yes, you will allow me to write code that is not functional, but I don't want to. We're making sure that we always have strict null checks turned on. And we are always making sure that we don't use any. Occasionally, you have to have third-party libraries, whatever. Sometimes you just have to use it. But pretty much in your own code, if you are using any, you must be doing something weird if you want to be strongly statically typed. Finally, we're going to avoid type casting. And again, similar to Kotlin, we're avoiding returns after case statements. So another example here, this is the same example pretty much that we looked at earlier. If we were to add a return after this case statement, uh, that would end with us disabling exhaustiveness checking for this code. Cool, so going forward, what you should be doing, using Elm, thinking like an Elm developer when you don't use Elm. Thank you very much. Perguntas? Quem quiser fazer pergunta em português, pode fazer e eu traduzo, tá? Fica à vontade. Hi. Uh, why did you decide to implement your own fuzzy matcher in Elm instead of integrating with a, the JavaScript one? So that's a great question. A lot of it for us, I think, came out of not wanting to have to use the like serializing and deserializing from JSON and not wanting that added complexity. I think if we wanted a more complex fuzzy matcher, we probably would have ended up using a port and going out to JavaScript. But with our application, it just didn't make sense, which is annoying because it also was more complicated. Yeah. I had a question. You, you said you don't test your HTML generation, but you do have this intermediate 
layer, the selector, mm -hmm. <coughs> you could presumably make unit tests that give a can selector and HTML, and then you wouldn't have to worry about, like, you change a word and the... Yeah, so we test our selectors, and then we have some happy path tests that are integration tests that run against our views, so making sure that the app will actually boot up. But trying to test our whole view in every possible thing that might go wrong has gotten really weird. For a while, we were doing something where we were splatting out our HTML and then matching through the string and trying to figure out what we were getting, and it just didn't make sense. I think they've actually been making that a little bit better in the last few months, but... You mentioned uh, that Elm still misses a lot of libraries. Uh, is that an active community working to create those libraries, and how long do you expect uh, those will come up? Uh, so the community is definitely working to create those libraries, and I think they're, it's really growing and, and changing. So I think that if Elm is still going in five years, absolutely, those libraries will be there. So. No more? All right. Thank you very much. Awesome talk.